Love that video. What a dramatic entrance into the conversation that we're having all month long. You see, if you missed last week, let me catch you up. Okay, the throne of our heart is not a stadium, and it is not a love seat where God will sit alongside all of the other priorities in our lives. Okay, the throne of our heart is a single seat that's made for a single occupant, and the only one who is worthy to sit on it demands exclusive rights to it. That's what we're talking about throughout this series. In case you missed last week, there's a couple resources that I want to recommend to you. These are resources that I'm using heavily throughout the series. The first one is called Counterfeit Gods by a guy named Timothy Keller. And the next one is Gods at War by Kyle Eidelman. I'm packing as much content from these resources as I can into this sermon and series. But if you want to go deeper, these would be great resources to pick up off off of Amazon. And that way you can follow along and, uh, and dive deeper into this idea of idolatry in our world today. But let's begin today by celebrating all the hardworking, schedule-keeping, boo-boo-kissing, booger-wiping moms in the room. Y'all give it up for the moms on Mother's Day. Listen, in honor of you on this special holiday weekend, we had the opportunity to to send five, I'm sorry, seven $500 gift cards to single moms in this community, just to tell them that we love them, we see what they're doing, and we want to invest in them. Look at a mom sitting near you and say, we did that for you. We did that for you, okay? On top of that, for Serve Day, we had volunteers that, that decorated uh, 200 flower pots. And this past week, we planted flowers on them and delivered them to the nursing homes as Mother's Day gifts to the residents. And listen, we, we did these things for two different reasons. We, we did it because there's an eternal impact that happens when people experience God's love through the local church. Okay, that's one of the reasons we did it. The second reason is because we believe wholeheartedly that motherhood is a ministry. Amen? All right, and motherhood is a ministry. And for for many of you, um, the the greatest thing you will ever do for the kingdom of God is, is through the people that you raise. And we know that's a big responsibility. It's one that moms do not take lightly. Which is why so many moms are plagued with insecurities and questions like, am I doing enough? Am I, am I measuring up? Am I making the right choices? Am I the best mom that I can possibly be? And so to answer those questions, I want to show you four examples from the animal kingdom. Okay, you ready for this? All right, did you know that cuckoo birds... Cuckoo birds, they trick other birds into raising their young by replacing an egg in another nest with their own. Hey, the worst thing you've ever done is drop your kids off at their grandparents' door and hightail it out of there, okay? Did you know that Queen Dracula ants, they feed on the blood of their own larva, okay? That's horrifying, right? I mean, like, you've done some sketchy things for an extra 30 minutes of sleep, But you have probably never done that. Did you know that koala moms, they feed their babies poop? Okay? Just straightforward, they feed their babies poop. Your kids just act like you do, okay? (laughs) And last but not least, did you know that hamster mothers eat their babies in stressful situations? Yeah. Let me just say, praise God for mental health awareness, am I right? (laughs) All right, with all that in mind, let me, let me just say this. Even on your worst day, moms, I think you're doing pretty good, okay? If you got your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 22. Today, we're going to talk about a parent in the Bible that, that took a bold step of obedience to God. But in taking that bold step of obedience, he risked everything else in his life, including any reputation he may have had for being a good parent. The story, it it begins with a promise or a covenant between God and Abraham. Okay, on on this side, God asks Abraham to give up everything. I mean, his country and his people, all of his hopes and his dreams, all the things that, that he had wanted throughout his entire life. But in return, God promises that he's going to provide Abraham with a son. 
through which he's going to bless the entire world and make Abraham the father of many nations. Now, this, this was a shocking promise because Sarah, Abraham's wife, had been unable to conceive. Biologically speaking, having children seemed impossible, but God's promise gave Abraham hope. It gave him the hope of a family. It, it gave him the hope of a legacy. It gave him the hope of a purpose that was bigger than himself. Now fast forward, and Abraham has waited for years and decades even for God to fulfill his end of the bargain. This period of waiting was so long that it created doubt in Abraham's heart. Something that we're going to unpack um, a little bit more next week. But by the time the child was born, the years of waiting, they had had another effect on Abraham's heart as well. Because no other person had ever longed for a child more than Abraham. No other person had ever placed more hope in a child than Abraham. And as a result, this child, Isaac, this gift from God was threatening to take God's seat on the throne of Abraham's heart. And so after Abraham receives all that had been promised to him, all that he had been waiting for, God asks him to give it all up. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. It's the first time this word is used in the Bible. Love. This is the son that he loves, Isaac. God tells him, go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Now listen, Abraham was destined to be a critical figure in the history of humanity. I mean, according to the promise, he would be the first of a new nation, a nation that that would be used by God to bless the world. But when you lay down a, a foundation for an important building, you test that foundation well. And Isaac is Abraham's ultimate test. You see, Abraham was a wealthy man, but God didn't test him there. Abraham was a married man, but God did not test him there. Why? Because if anything was going to pull Abraham's eyes away from God, it would be this child. And so God asks Abraham to make the ultimate sacrifice. Here's the first reality from this difficult passage today. Idolatry is often hidden in God's greatest gifts. You see, at its root, idolatry is the subtle choice to worship the gift instead of the giver. See, no parent can read this story and not get just a little bit uncomfortable, right? I mean, our kids are an incredible gift from God most days. But before we go any farther, we need to extend the parameters of the story. Because it's not just about children. This story is about any relationship that encroaches on God's throne. So I want you to think to yourself for just a moment, who do you love? I mean, who would you lay down your life for? Who are you more thankful for than anybody else in your life? Because the truth is, the more beautiful a relationship is, the more capacity it has to become an idol. The more we fear losing it, the more likely we are to worship it. And like Abraham, our potential in life may be determined by how we steward these gifts. See, I want you to picture your life like a a bicycle wheel, okay? And, And all the spokes that come out in different directions, they represent the different relationships in your life. One of the spokes represents your mom, and one represents your dad. One, two, or three represents your siblings and your children. One represents your spouse, and on and on it goes. Our tendency as humans is is to make God a spoke in the wheel. But the thing is, that becomes clear through this story, is that God is not interested in being another spoke in the wheel of our lives. God demands to be the center hub that all the other spokes come out of and connect to. 
You see, when God gives us a child, when God gives us a parent, when God gives us a friend or a spouse, he is giving us a beautiful gift. And he says, this is something that I created for you. It's, it's good. I made it for you. I want you to have it. But he still insists that we not take what he called good and remove a letter to make it God. You see, we can love it, we can keep it, and we can steward it well only if it remains in its proper place. You see, all the gifts in our lives, they should increase our love for the giver, not threaten to replace that love altogether. Let's keep reading, and we're going to find out how Abraham responds to this impossible challenge. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up, and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. You see, Abraham it, it emphasizes that he sets off early the next morning, which means if, if he struggles or if he debates within himself, he doesn't do so for very long because he is up with the sun preparing his supplies and preparing his heart for the journey ahead. Now, this journey, it must have felt like a funeral procession. I mean, nobody else that was with them understood or recognized what Abraham was planning to do, but they had to notice that he wasn't quite right, that he was burdened and overwhelmed. So after several days, he tells the servants, he says, stay here while Isaac and I go to worship. I don't want you to miss that word, worship, because this is a meaningful point in the story. The presence of this word and idea, worship, right here at the moment of truth, it tells us everything we need to know about Abraham's heart and his priorities. Because in choosing God over everything and everyone else, he is defining for us what it means to worship. Listen, write this second truth down. Dethroning idols is an urgent act of worship. You see, more than the songs that we sing, more so than even the prayers that we pray, obedience and surrender is the ultimate posture of worship. When you and I as believers, when we recognize that God's throne is being compromised by anything at all, we must take immediate action, just like Abraham did. Why? Because the longer we delay, the easier it is to disobey. Let's talk about cicada bugs for just a minute, okay? How many of you thought this was a fascinating thing for like the first 10 minutes, okay? That was me. I thought it was great. I mean, I had fun. I was out there with my kids. We were pulling them off the trees, sticking them to our shirts, scaring our, one of our daughters with them. Like, it was a blast. But how many of you are so tired of it, you can't stand it any longer, okay? That's me, okay? Every single time I get in the car, that noise in the background, I feel like there's something wrong with my engine, okay? Every time I lay down to go to sleep at night, I hear that sound and I think we must have left the water on outside. Every time I go to Kroger, it sounds like it's being robbed by screaming toddlers. It is driving me absolutely crazy. But the reality is, if it were to go on for another month, we'd barely even notice it. And if it were to go on for another six months, we would have to work to even hear it. Why? Because we are hardwired with this incredible ability to overlook recurring problems by becoming less sensitive to them over time. Let me tell you something. What's true of sight, sounds, and smells can cause eternal damage to our hearts. Because there are eternal consequences to placing another human being on the throne of our heart. You see, the longer we allow it to go on, its grip will tighten and our resolve will weaken. Which is why we've got to make the hard choice today to address those things quickly, urgently, before they have time to get comfortable on God's seat on the throne of our hearts. Now let's jump back into the story, okay? Did you notice that 
there was something strange about what Abraham said to his servants. He told them, he said, we will go and worship, okay? But then he says, we will come back to you. You see, it would have made sense if he had said, we are going to go off and worship and then I will return to you. But he doesn't say that. It's, it's clear, even as he prepares to do the unthinkable, that he still fully trusts God, even when he doesn't understand God at all. You see, he knows that God has promised a nation through his son, and Abraham still believes that somehow, some way, God is going to deliver on his promise. Let's read the rest of the story, starting in verse 6. It says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Listen, this, this kind of puts the whole koala thing in perspective, doesn't it? You see, the, this account of the story, it, it doesn't go deep into the feelings of the individuals involved. But we can't help but hear the tension in Isaac's question, can we? But still, Abraham remains steadfast in his obedience faith. Verses 9 through 10 says, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Listen, in this final moment of the greatest test, Abraham prepares to do the unthinkable and he never falters for a minute until he hears a voice from heaven to stop him. Verses 11 through 13 says, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns, He went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Listen, Abraham passes this difficult test. The voice from heaven says, now I know that you fear God. The question that I have is, did God need convincing in the first place? Of course not. God knew the state of Abraham's heart. But as long as Abraham never had to choose between his son and obedience to God, he would never be able to see that his love for his son was becoming idolatrous. If God had not intervened, Abraham would have allowed a crack in the foundation of God's plan by placing his hope and trust in someone that was never meant to carry it. You see, Isaac was a wonderful gift to Abraham. But he was not safe to have and hold until Abraham was willing to put God first. In this story, Abraham shows the depth of his love and commitment to God. And that will enable him to love his son in an appropriate way. The way God designed him to in an ordered way. Here's the final truth that we're going to pull out of this story today. We love others best when we love God most. We love others best when we love God most. If anyone allows any human relationship to occupy God's seat on the throne of our hearts, it creates an idolatrous love that will smother the person and strangle the relationship. You see, our relationship with God is more basic and foundational to who we are and who we were created to be than any other relationship in our lives. And for that reason, it absolutely must come first. Let me explain it in this way, okay? Sometimes when I get dressed in the morning, I button up my shirt, okay? I didn't do that today because I knew I was going to have this sermon illustration, okay? 
And, and what I do is I start at the top. I leave that top one open and I, I start buttoning the next one. And as long as I get that top button right, then everything else falls in line, right? Everything lines up the way it's supposed to. Everything falls into place. But if I get that first button wrong, then it forces everything else to be out of alignment. And all of a sudden, I end up looking like this. I mean, I look absolutely ridiculous. And in the exact same way, God has ordered our lives in such a way that our devotion to Him is a top button issue. If that relationship is in proper order, then you're going to find that every other relationship in your life is going to fall in place in a more satisfying way. But if you're wrong on Him, you'll be wrong on everybody else too. You see, we are intended to love our children, our parents, our siblings, our friends, our spouse wholeheartedly. But we're called to love them in the context of our primary foundational love for God. What that means is that you will be a better father and a better husband and a better friend if you prioritize your relationship with God first. You will be a better mother and a better sibling and a better roommate when you prioritize your relationship with God first. Because it's only when we love God properly that we can love others properly too. He must be our deepest love. He must be our first love and he must be the source of every other love. That's what the story of Abraham teaches you see, Abraham is a biblical hero that no one wants to be. But he's an incredible example that we all need to follow. Here's our sermon in a sentence today. God's gifts do not fit or belong on the throne of our hearts. You see, God tells us in the first commandment, the one we talked about last week, that we should have no other gods before him. But the second commandment is that we should not make an idol in the form of anything, including the relationships that he has blessed us with. Why? Because the gift is not the king, and the heart, throne of our heart belongs to God. My question is, are you willing to make him the Lord of your life, the one who is holy and set apart, the one who sits alone on the throne of your heart today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we apologize for all the times that we've allowed something else to creep onto the seat that belongs to you. God, we know that there is nothing in this world, no thing and no relationship, no person, no priority or ambition that deserves that spot. God, it's okay to have those things. It's okay to, to embrace those things and even love those things, but but only if we get our relationship with you right first. Only if we love them and hold them within the context of our deepest and most sincere love for you. And so God, I pray that you help us today. We pray that you help us to do figuratively what Abraham was willing to do physically, God, that we would just sacrifice anything and everything at the altar for you. And say, God, we'll allow you to realign the priorities of our life. But right here and right now, we surrender to you and no one else. God, I pray that you would help us to live that way. Convict us where we need to address the idolatry in our hearts. So that we can love you the way that we were intended to. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let me tell you the most beautiful part of this story. Okay, it was, it was 2,000 years later that Jesus came to this world. You see, God created us to be in a relationship with him, but our sins, it messed it all up. It separated us from God, and there's nothing we can do on our own that would remove that sin problem in our lives. And so 2,000 years after this story takes place, Jesus comes to this world, and God does through him what Abraham was almost about to do. He sacrifices him on the cross. He allows him to die as a demonstration of his unconditional love for us. 
And so even in this moment, as we're making hard choices to say, God, we surrender everything we have to you. We choose you over anything and everything else. I just want you to know God has already done that for you. He has already chosen you. He has already made the ultimate sacrifice for you. And if you're not ready yet to lay everything down at the altar, I just want to challenge you to spend a few minutes thinking about the gift that he's made available to you. Knowing that this isn't just about changing behavior, it's about experiencing Jesus in a way that creates transformation in and through us. Listen, if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you want to talk to somebody about what that means, we've got people available on both sides of the stage. You can follow the light during this next song, have a conversation with them. They would love to pray with you and answer any questions that you have. Our altars are going to be open where you can come and you can pray and you can spend time with Jesus just saying, I choose you now. The rest of us, we're going to sing this song. We're going to sing all hail King Jesus. We put you on the throne and we praise you and worship you because only you are.